Okay, so let's look at the derivatives of the batch norm. So we have two new parameters, right? We have the gammas, the scale parameters, and the beta, the shift parameters, which we have to find. These are actually quite easy. We also need to back propagate the gradient with regards to Z so we can use it for the weights previously in the network. Yeah, so we have this network. It reaches eventually the loss. We take the gradient with regards to going back. Then we take the gradients with regard to the outputs of the batch norm, which are basically the normalized, but with the gamma and beta added to it. Yeah, so Z tilde is the gamma times Z norm plus the beta. And we are going to denote the gradient all the way here by delta, okay? So in the backprop video, I denoted by delta only all the way here, yeah? But here I'm also adding the derivative with regards to the activations. It's a notational decision, and here I just des decided to do it like this. And now we have to find the gradients with regards to gamma and beta, and then we also have to go back to the normalized z and then finally to the z in order from here to find the gradients with regards to w and go back and find the gradients again with regards to the previous weights. Okay, so we denote the gradient all the way up to here as delta. Now we need to find the gradients with regards to gamma. So the derivative of the loss with regards to gamma is just the derivative all the way to here and then the derivative of this with regards to gamma. Well, the derivatives of this with regards to gamma is just the z normalized. So all we get is this thing over here. Notice that again, when we are using matrices and going over the entire batch, this will be an n by k matrix. And okay, this is the n of the batch size and this n means normalized. And this will be a one by k vector, but we'll broadcast it, we'll duplicate it to be an n by k matrix. And all operations here are element wise. Now that's great, but uh, we need to accumulate the gradient over the entire batch. So we sum it up over the entire batch, or we take a dot product with a transpose one vector. Okay, with regards to the beta, it's the same idea. We take the gradient all the way to the z tilde, and then the z tilde with regards to beta. Here, the gradient of this with regards to beta is just one. So we have one here. And so we just get that it's equal to the delta. And again, we have to sum it up over the entire batch. So we get this thing over here. Now for disease, we also need to find the derivatives of mu and sigma because they are also a function of z. So notation wise, I'm going to drop the z's. Uh, we already know that mu and sigma are a function of z's. And also for them, I'm also going to drop the L which specifies the layer. And also note that the derivative with regards to z, we will keep it as a matrix of n and k. The accumulation uh, for the loss, for example, of the weights that come before it is done with an outer product. And if you don't remember this, please review the back propagation video. Okay, so we want that the final derivative of the z will be an n by k matrix. Let's first look at the derivative of the loss with regards to the normalized z's. So it's the derivative of the loss with regards to z tilde times the derivative of z tilde uh, with regards to the z normalized. This is denoted by delta. This is just equal to the gamma, right? Because this is the equation. The derivative of this with regards to z normalized is just the gamma. Okay, so we get this. So now we have all the derivatives all the way up to this thing. Okay, now we want the derivative with regards to sigma squared. So it's the derivative all the way to the normalized z's times the derivative of the normalized z's with regards to sigma squared. The normalized z's is just equal to this. If we take the derivative of this with regards to sigma squared, it's equal to this thing over here. And so this is what we have. Again, this is actually, we already found what it is. It's this, but I'm not going to write these all the time. So I'm just gonna write this. And yeah, we have to accumulate it over the batch. And so we get this thing over here. With regards to mu, notice that sigma itself is also a function of mu. And so there are two ways to do it. Let's look at the basic way to do it. So the derivative with regards to mu is just the derivative with regards to the normalized z's times the derivative of the normalized z's with regards to mu. Now we said this is the normalized z's. We have to take the derivative with regards to mu. So let's do it with basic calculus. We have a quotient here. So it's the derivative of the numerator 
times the denominator minus the numerator times the derivative of the denominator divided by the denominator squared. This is equal to this thing over here. Derivative of this, if we calculate it, is turns out to be this thing over here. But notice that here we have a sum of disease minus the mean of disease, and we have the sum of it over the entire batch. So this thing will be zero, okay? So this second term will cancel, and we'll be only left with this first term. In the first term, this will cancel with this, and we will get a square root here. And so this is what we get. Again, we have to accumulate it, and we get this thing over here. Now, this was one way to do it. Another way to do it is to look at the computational graph. So we computed a gradient all the way up to here, and now we want to compute the gradients with regards to mu, but there are two paths that lead to it. One is the direct path, and one is this indirect path, okay? So we can look at the direct path, yeah, all the way from Zn and then from Zn to mu, and then the indirect path is all the way to sigma squared and from sigma squared to mu. Okay, and in the first term, in this term over here, we don't consider the dependence of sigma squared on mu because this is already taken care of in this direction over here. And so this is what they do in the original paper, but the both ways are equivalent. So this is what we had before. Yeah, this equation over here, it's exactly this equation over here. And now, yeah, this is equal to this, and this is equal to the derivative with regards to mu, as I showed here. Then we multiply this by the second term, we get this, this, and this remains the same, it's this. The derivative of this is equal to this. Okay, we already saw it here, yeah. And so now we're just going to color it differently, yeah. We're going to color all of this as this light pink and the rest with yellow. And now this is exactly equal to the derivative with regards to sigma squared. We already saw it here. And this is the derivative of sigma squared with regards to mu. You can verify it yourself. Okay, so we saw that these two options are identical. Why are we going to do this? Because now I want to do it again for disease. So we have the derivative all the way here. We can now compute the direct path, which is to here. And to that, we need to add the derivative all the way here and then the derivative here. And we also need to add the path from here to here. So we have three different paths that lead to z. So we will have three different gradients. And this is what I've written here. The derivative with regards to the z's is equal to the derivative of to the part of the normalized z's times the derivative of the normalized z's with regards to z's, where here in this direct path, I'm not considering the dependence of mu or sigma squared on the z's. This is taken care of by these two paths. And then in these two paths, I have the path all the way to sigma squared and then from sigma squared to z, and I have the path to mu and then from mu to z. Okay, if I calculate this, it's equal to this. If I calculate this, it's equal to this. And if I calculate this, it's equal to this. Okay, so you can just verify it. The mu is just the sum of the z's divided by the batch size. And so if I take the derivative with regards to a specific z, it's just one over n. And likewise for the sigma squared, and here we are taking the derivative of this thing with regards to the z, it's just one over what's left. Okay, now notice that all of these will be matrices when we move to batch implementation, but these two terms, yeah, this and this will be vectors, but again, they have to be broadcasted, okay? They will be duplicated in order for the element-wise operations to work. So finally, we have this final expression over here, and now a quiz question. What happens if we sum the rows of this matrix? Yeah, so this is an n by k matrix. What happens if we sum the rows of this matrix? Yeah, so for each neuron, we have k neurons. Yeah, if we just focus on one neuron, we have an n by one uh, vector. What happens if we sum up this vector? So if you think you know, please leave a comment in the comment sections below. Okay, now I want to simplify this a little bit. I will put the terms that we found for this and for this in the equation. So this is the terms we found for the sigma squared. This is the terms that we found for the mu's. Now I'm going to take out some common factors. So this is a common factor. I'm going to take it out. N also appears here and here. It doesn't appear here, so I'm going to multiply it by N. 
Okay, so we get this expression over here. Here, I also did another thing. I took one half out, so there's still one here, but I'm going to divide it into half and half. One half I'm going to put here, and I'm going to take outside of the sum. Yeah, this is the sum. And one half I'm going to leave inside the sum. And now notice that this thing is just the normalized Z. Same for this thing. This is just the normalized Z. So this is how we can simplify the expression a bit and we get this final thing. Here I wrote it again in this orange gold color. And in the notebook that accompanies this lesson, we will implement this version over here. Okay, so these were the derivatives. Final thing is talking about inference time. So at inference time, we don't want the outputs to be noisy. We don't want them to be dependent on the batch that we put the axes in. And what happens if we just put a single axe? We don't have a batch. We just give it a single observation to the network and tell it to predict what it is. We don't have a batch there. So what do we do? Well, what we do is we keep track of the overall or population mean and standard deviation, and then use the population mean and standard deviation to normalize the inputs to each layer. And these will be fixed. Once we finish training, the population mean and variance of each neuron in each batch norm layer will stay fixed. Now we could have kept track of the actual population mean and variance. There are, there are formulas to update the mean and the variance to get the actual population mean and variance if we are doing it in a sequential manner. Here, we should have also multiplied by the by the size of the batch, but they get canceled in the numerator and denominator, maybe except for the final batch, which might not have the exact batch size. Yeah, but we could have worked it out somehow. Yeah, we, if we wanted, we could arrive at the real population mean and the real population variance. There are also many advanced algorithms for calculating variance. You can check out the Wikipedia page that talks about it. And also we can use a non-biased version of the variance meaning we divide by n minus one instead of n. Yeah, so this is what we could have done. What actually is being done is taking a simple moving average of the means and the variance. This is mistakenly called momentum for some reason. I mean, momentum is doing moving average, but in the context of optimization where taking a moving average gives you a certain momentum in a certain direction of the gradient, here, this doesn't apply. So I think the use of the word momentum here is wrong, but nonetheless, this is the word that is kind of used. And this is also the parameter name that PyTorch gives to this uh, moving average parameter over here. Yeah, so this is what PyTorch used. This is what is usually being done. I guess maybe for reasons of simplicity and maybe computational reasons as well, these formulas might be a bit expensive to compute, but yeah, this is what is being done. So this is what we do in inference time. And so we have to keep track of the means and the variances during training. This is done during training. And then we keep these population or moving average uh, means and variance, and we use them in inference time. Okay, so this is all for this video. I hope you enjoy it and see you in the next one.